I just know it. Well, come on. It's 42. Episode 42, to be exact. We had to include some reference to uh, hitchhikers and all that. <laughs> anyway, um, on slightly more related channel admin topics, there's some, well, I guess it could be good news, could be bad news, depending on what perspective you want to uh, take on it. I looked into the channel about a week or two ago, and then I noticed a weird spike in my analytics, and I thought, oh, this graph has uh, never moved before. What on earth is this? And it says, oh, you have earned some money from your videos. And I'm looking at it going, really? I don't remember enabling monetization. In fact, I distinctly remember YouTube telling me to go and get stuffed about a year and a half ago. Um, what the heck is this? And it appears that YouTube, in its infinite wisdom, has randomly decided that it wants my channel monetized. And so it has, without actually me asking them. Um, that's a bit of a weird situation, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, so, in view of that, um, I've, well, I've left the monetization where they put it on some of the older back catalogue of videos. Um, but going forward, obviously I appreciate this channel has been ad-free for a very long time, and I know that quite a number of viewers appreciate that, and, uh, I do want to respect and acknowledge that going forward. So... I am in a little bit of a quandary because do I just switch it all off? Do I switch it partially on? What do I do? I'm, I definitely don't want this sort of intrusive ads everywhere that you get. So, um, as per you might have noticed at the beginning of this video, I would like to propose an experiment whereby I am going to um, proposing to keep the five minute guides uh, ad free completely, um, unless they allow just a small little banner ad or something but prob probably ad free entirely um and for content whose uh, length exceeds say half an hour something like dry dock or uh, the longer specials then i'd like to put just a single skippable ad at the beginning and uh, then you can skip it or not if you want um and see how that goes now obviously this is just a proposal. Uh, I don't want to annoy vast swathes of the user base, and obviously <laughs> um, I appreciate probably a fair number of you probably running ad block anyway, um, so it won't affect you too much. Um, but yeah, so that's my proposal. Let me know in the comments what you think. Um, if you prefer the channel to be completely ad-free continuing going forward, then I'm quite happy to oblige if that's what the majority of the viewership wants. So the videos under consideration this week specifically are the USS Montana 5 minute guide and then the Wednesday special which consisted of a short video on unusual uses of the Essex class followed by a couple of revoiced short specials. So let's go on with looking at the Montana video first and the sources for the Montana video consist primarily of two very excellent books uh, that's uh, Battleships, United States Battleships um, by uh, Doolin and Garski, as well as Norman Friedman's, arguably even better, U.S. Battleships and Illustrated Design History. So those are the two sources from which information for that video was taken. General Obi-Wan Kenobi asks, What are your thoughts on the test of the 16-inch 50 caliber gun on the turret faceplate of the Yamato class? So he is, of course, referring to the somewhat famous, at least in naval circles, test that resulted in what you can see above. And yes, that is the, uh, well, it's the turret face that was planned for one of the turrets of Shinano, which has then had a 16-inch 50 caliber shell punched straight through it. Um, and that's the thickest part of the armor on the Yamato class. So, yeah, it, on the face of it, this looks like a pretty decisive uh, blow and uh, possibly proof that an Iowa or a Montana could punch straight through any part of the Yamato. However, this does bear a little bit more examination. Now, two tests were carried out. The first test on 16th of October 1946 was the one that caused the creation of this particular little piece of naval memorabilia. And they were using inert projectiles for the very good reason they didn't want to blow up their own test range. This projectile obviously punched through the armor plate and went sailing off into the Potomac River. So if anyone has a metal detector and a very big magnet, 
Uh, maybe go fishing there if you can get the proper permits. Now, to establish a few facts of the case, yes, the projectile struck with a velocity that approximates what a 16-inch 50 caliber projectile would have in uh, a battle hit at a range of about maybe 11,000 yards, um, the muzzle velocity, the striking velocity being a bit lower than the muzzle velocity of the uh, gun at uh, time of firing, obviously. Now, that has to be tempered with the fact that this shot was set up basically dead on at 90 degrees and anyone who's looked at Yamato's turrets will immediately spot that the turret faces are not in fact mounted at 90 degrees they're sloped back at around about 45 degrees give or take a bit so this test is not really representative of what would have happened in quote unquote real life because at that sort of 10 to 15,000 uh, bracket of range the 16-inch 50 shells are falling at an angle of between just under 6 and just under 10 degrees. So they're at, that, at the kind of striking velocity they're talking about, you are only going to be negating that roughly 45 degree slope on the Yamato's turrets by, well, I say between just about 6 and 10 degrees. So it's still going to have a, approximately 35 to 40 degree slope, which then means obviously... A test that relies on the shell striking at zero degrees is not really particularly useful. In fact, you actually have to go out to about 40,000 yards before the shell will hit at 45 degrees. And, uh, well, you're not going to hit anything at 45,000 yards, uh, 40, yards in a battleship duel. It's, it's just not going to happen, really. Um, they did a second test, uh, which almost made it all the way through, which had a striking velocity of 1,700 feet per second, um, which is still about 100 feet per second uh, more than would be attained by a strike at 40,000 yards. And as we said before, it's, you, you're just not going to hit at 40,000 yards. Just forget it. So overall, in terms of what I think of the test, well, it's a very good way of showing just how powerful the 16-inch uh, 50 caliber gun was. Um, it's certainly no, not... Uh, disgraceful performance and uh, firing against an oblique target getting through the Amato's faceplate is re uh, just about what you would expect for a, an AP Mark 8 shell at 10,000 yards or so but as I said it's it's not representative of real life so once you take into account the actual angle that would have been occurring in in an actual engagement I think the Yamato's turrets probably still would have been uh, proof against that kind of range of shot so, yeah, Yamato is very heavily armoured for a good reason. Please bear in mind, though, that isn't to say that the Yamato's turrets are immune to effects, because, let's face it, it's a very heavy shell that's going to be hitting. There are going to be some rather nasty effects on the people inside um, from the shockwaves and such, but you, um, basically, just to loop back on the original point, you can't use, really use this as proof of the penetrative power of a 16-inch 50 gun against the Yamato's turret because it's a completely unrealistic setup. Um, you could use it as proof of penetration if they're in a point-blank range against the armor belt, but that's an entirely different matter, and I think we already knew that. ST Rub asks, well, two questions, so I'll fold them into one. Um, what type of ship was pushed farthest away from its original job, and what role would the Royal Marines have had if the war in the Pacific had continued? Would they have linked up with the US Marines or continue to act as special forces? So, traditionally answering the second question first, if the war in the Pacific had continued, yeah, I think the, the latter part is more likely. I mean, the Royal Marines have never been and never will be the, the size, scope, or scale of the U.S. Marines. The U.S. Marines, to a certain degree, are very much characterized by the phrase the U.S. Navy's army. Um, they are a fully-fledged fl military force. They have, well, what in almost any other navy would be called carriers. They have tanks. They have artillery. I mean, the, the U.S. Marine Corps on its own is bigger than a significant portion of armies on the planet so that's why they end up doing an awful lot of amphibious assaults in world war ii um the royal marines they did take part in amphibious operations obviously there were royal marine units around at d-day and things like that but as you mentioned they they also sort of double up as kind of special forces the royal marine commandos etc um so yes if the pacific war had continued I can't see the 
British throwing the the Royal Marines into the same kind of actions that the US Marines were generally thrown into, um, but you might have squads or commandos of Marines being uh, dedicated to the same landings, but with specific um, target points, like maybe uh, shore defences or specific communications networks or um, or things like that, and especially when we're if we're talking about the Pacific War continuing, you're pretty much talking about an invasion of Japan. Um, so yeah, I think that that would have been the ro more likely role of the Royal Marines in that conflict. And as for which it was pushed furthest from its original job, well, you could make a cheap and easy argument and say any of the carrier conversions, um, probably of all of them, maybe it'd be a toss-up, I think, between something like HMS Furious or the Japanese Karga. Um, some of the other carrier conversions being like full battle cruisers were designed for kind of high speed scouting and strike roles, which is kind of what a carrier does, just in a very different way. Um, but uh, something like Furious, which was designed as an effectively as an amphibious shore bombardment support ship, um, and Cargo, which was originally supposed to be a full on battleship, uh, both very, very different from the role of uh, a carrier. So that that would be an easy answer, um, but perhaps uh, another answer in terms of uh, a ship being pushed farthest away from its original job in at least staying within a combat role would be perhaps uh, some of the British C-class cruisers uh, in World War II because they were built as fleet scouts um, intended to combat the enemy fleet screen and destroyers back in the First World War. They were then refitted, a number of them, into anti-aircraft cruisers um, and at that point had no business going anywhere near another surface ship in combat. So um, that would be that would be another example of a, a combat ship pushed very very far from its originally intended role. And um, then, if you want to sort of cross the line between civilian and military use, um, as SD Rob mentions, there's a harbor tug that was used for all sorts of wonderful, um, wonderful roles. As uh, taking the design from it, he mentions things like harbor tugs, mail carriers, fireboat, gunboat, flakboat, radar boat. Uh, radar picket and rocket boat and similarly the uh, whaler design that was eventually adapted into the flower class corvettes um, going from a relatively sedentary civilian occupation to hunting u-boats well i guess they're both kind of undersea undersea things that you try and hunt but um, fortunately or unfortunately i think these days um, whales have yet to be equipped with torpedoes so possibly slightly less dangerous and lastly from this video, Bohemian Monk asks, Would it have been possible for the Japanese to use their submarines as a gun line at Midway in order to bushwhack the American carriers? So, obviously, if the IJN had managed to get a significant number of their submarines into torpedo range of the American carriers at Midway, then yes, that would have uh, <laughs> changed the balance of things a lot quite significantly because, well, torpedoes. Um, but in terms of using them as a gun line, as you mentioned, which um, I believe you so the idea came to you for where you managed to achieve this in a game. Um, no, I don't think that's going to be very successful for two primary reasons. One, the carriers have escorts, and the escorts, especially the destroyers, um, particularly when you're dealing with surface submarines, have their own guns, um, which is going to be a problem. But even with the, the dispersed nature of escorts on anti-aircraft duty, the fact is that the American carriers are also still carrying 5-inch 38 caliber guns, single ones, eight of them per carrier, uh, which means that in any individual engagement, the carrier, albeit that it's not designed for surface engagements, actually has a, a significant uh, gunnery advantage over a single submarine, or two, or even three, and obviously if they get even closer, the the um, smaller caliber weaponry, the 40 millimeter, and everything, will... Um, will come into effect and even if you had a half dozen submarines trying to go after a single Yorktown class I'd still give the odds to the Yorktown class because um, a Yorktown class carrier can take a lot more small caliber sort of four or five inch range uh, hits of the kind you'd expect to find on a Japanese submarine's deck gun whereas submarines are nowhere near as durable when it comes to being hit by return fire and the, the carrier is a lot more stable as a gun platform.
almost makes you wish that you did sighted a battle where Lexington or Saratoga would have been present because then the 8-inch gun crews, assuming that it takes place at a period where the, those 8-inch guns are still on, they would have gone, yeah, yeah, I have a purpose for once. And so moving on to the um, medley of videos from Wednesday, the uh, Essex class, unusual uses of the Essex class video, well, it's taken from the same sources as the Essex class video, so there you go. Um, so let's get on with some questions. Derek Henschel, I think, asks, why did the US Navy only make one Enterprise-class nuclear carrier? I know there were costs involved, but were there any other reasons? So Enterprise was originally supposed to be the first of a class, but, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but to a certain degree the US Navy had no idea what it was doing when it was building a nuclear-powered class, uh, nuclear -powered carrier. That's not to imply incompetence, that's simply a fact no one had built a nuclear-powered carrier or any nuclear-powered ship on that kind of scale. So when I say they don't know what they were doing, it was literally a case of, well, it's the first time anybody has done this. Um, we can apply our existing naval expertise and uh, see how that goes, but we don't actually really 100% know how this is going to turn out, which obviously in later, later vessels uh, they did because they had the experience of building it in the first place. One of the major reasons, well, one of the major reasons for the cost, and also as a standalone reason as why they didn't build more of the class, was because they, when they installed the nuclear reactors, they literally did a one-for-one -one replacement of nuclear reactors for conventional boilers, as per the original, the older sort of Kitty Hawk Constellation uh, Forestal class carriers. So you had a carrier with a rather worrying eight nuclear reactors on board. Now, I say rather worrying because, well, a nuclear reactor is a very delicate thing and something you need a lot of very skilled people with a lot of very expensive expertise to keep running, and even then accidents occasionally do happen. Now imagine trying to run with eight of these things happen going at any one time. Um... It's a maintenance nightmare, and it is a dramatically increased risk of something going wrong because you have eight times the uh, the risk, the chances of something uh, happening. So yeah, that that that's one of the single biggest reasons why they didn't build more Enterprise class. You'll notice what came immediately after it was, of course, the Nimitz class. The Nimitz class going down to a rather more manageable two reactors albeit somewhat bigger. And there was also the fact that as a sort of first of the class with all the power available from nuclear reactors, they kind of threw everything they could uh, onto the Enterprise. So it had four rudders instead of two. Um, it had a slightly different hull design, but it also had a lot of brand new semi-experimental systems like radar and such, like at a time when electronics were advancing pretty quickly. So with so many sort of half experimental systems on board by the time they'd finished it was more a case of well let's take the lessons we've learned from the enterprise and refine them take away the bits that didn't work um, improve the bits that did and by the time you've done all of that you end up with uh, a situation where you now have effectively a brand new design um, because of all the changes you've made and that design turns into the Nimitz. ST Rub has a question in this video as well. He says, can you explain how the countries of World War II were able to expand the number of crews and still keep the quality to a high standard? Well, in a fair number of cases, actually, they weren't able to. Um, crew quality was noted to go down in a number of navies, um, not necessarily across the board, but certainly in certain aspects. Uh, the Axis Navy is suffering a little bit more from this. Um, than the Allied navies. But you do make a fair point in that for a good part of the war, most of the navies were expanding and generally their crew quality stayed high. So this was accomplished by a variety of means, one of which was the very simple expedient of when a ship has come into port and needs refit or repairs that are going to last for a significant amount of time, uh, the crew might be reallocated to other tasks. So you see this with the Scharnhorst class when they are stuck in Brest, a good portion of their veteran crew get shipped back to Germany and stuck on other ships. So uh, that's a way of kind of stretching your crews out a bit because you've got, well, two small battleships worth of crew 
um, but they then go on to crew quite a number of other ships without needing too many newbies. Um, although, obviously, then you need a new crew for the Shan Horse class once they actually get out in back into action. Um, but no, that, that that was a way of doing things. So you could, you could share crews across ships, um, because even in the middle of war, a ship that's been in operations for a long time has either got damaged or just worn out. It's better to use the crew elsewhere, and then when that ship comes in, you can shift them over either to another ship or back to their old one, depending on how long it's taken to repair or refit their previous vessel. So that's one method. Uh, another m method is the naval reserves. Um, so different countries run it in different ways, but generally most countries with a serious navy had some form of reserve that was made up of retired officers and men or people who had just served their terms in the navy and been discharged gone back into civilian life or whatever um so in times of war you depending on which reserve you were in you either would be or could be called up so a lot of ships were crewed uh either wholly or in part from reserve officers and men which obviously they needed a little bit of a brush up to get up to date with the latest techniques but the sort of the training and discipline and such at the core were still all there so that was a, a quick way of expanding the naval forces um then on top of that if you had to commit what were effectively green sailors to combat uh, you would try and leaven up their their ranks by including a uh, sort of a, a core of experienced men so for example if you have a going back, almost go back to our original example if you have a the crew of a cruiser say um, that's come in with heavy damage and you know that cruiser is going to be out of action for six months to a year you might take that crew and then you might distribute that crew along um, amongst two or three other new cruisers so each of those new cruisers will have a partially experienced crew who can then pass on their experience and uh, and uh, techniques to the more green newbie crew that have come in with them. And on top of all that, there is just simply the matter of training. Um, the US Navy, the Royal Navy, etc., they had extensive training programs. Um, most navies, obviously, especially with the US Navy with a couple of years extra peacetime, could see the writing on the wall and could expand their training regimens um, before war broke out and even in the European navies you could see tensions building so uh, the number of uh, tr people in regular training in the intakes went up and so between that and expanding the training facilities you could get a reasonable standard of train crew out there um, with uh, within reasonable expectations of them being fairly competent. I mean obviously yeah you don't want absolute sort of scratched last minute green train crews if you can at all avoid it and where you have to take those people and you distribute them amongst the more experienced uh, crew probably more as a replacement for casualties and transfers on existing ships than giving them a brand new ship to themselves. John K asks what would you rather have seen preserved HMS Dreadnought or RMS Olympic? HMS Dreadnought by Country Mile. Um, the ship actually changed the course of naval history and naval warfare. Um, and whilst the Olympic is a nice ship, and okay, yes, everyone can see the obvious elephant in the room. Ultimately, it's the Titanic sister ship. The Titanic's famous for sinking. Um, yes, at the time it was the biggest ship in the world and all that, but uh, ships came along that were much bigger than it, and so what what purpose really would it have served other than some kind of slightly creepy way of also commemorating the Titanic, I guess? Uh, whereas Dreadnought, as I say, would be a useful piece of history to have as a museum ship um, and certainly uh, should have been preserved, in my opinion. Toby Wood asks, Is the Battle of Jutland worthy of more recognition or was it largely insignificant in the grander scheme of World War I? I think it's definitely worthy of a lot more recognition than it gets. Um, I was lucky enough to attend a lecture, oh, pushing two and a half years ago now, um, which was chaired by the historian Dan Snow, who by the way is absurdly tall, um, uh, on basically that question. Um, was it the battle that won World War I? And um, I tend to agree with that premise because it's it's not so much about the battle itself as what the battle meant and led to, or could have led to if it had gone another way, uh, because one of the major factors in Germany's defeat was the fact that they just 
did not have the ability to replace and generate certain critical resources and they had up to and including food um, and they had to come up with well first copies and then copies of copies so uh, one of the more famous examples obviously in German I think it's ersatz means uh, sort of replacement for uh, so you had coffee and then they started running out of coffee so they had ersatz coffee which was made up of ground up vegetables and then the ground up vegetables started running around out so you had a mixture of ground up acorns and sawdust which was ersatz ersatz coffee uh, gives you some idea of just how desperate things have gotten in Germany and quite why they went in for a full socialist revolution right at the end of the First World War. And a lot of that, both in things like food, but also in things like war-critical resources, such as nitrates for explosives, all of this was cut off by the Royal Navy blockade. If Jutland had been lost, um, and a significant portion of the Royal Navy's battle fleet sunk, then the blockade would be, have been broken, because there would have been nothing to stop the high seas fleet sweeping away the, es the uh, escorts and cruisers that were manning the blockade, at which point Germany can import a lot more raw resources and food. Whether or not that would have necessarily meant they would have won in the end is a very big butterfly, but it certainly would have changed the course of World War I completely, um, quite possibly in a way that would have resulted in Britain and, and or France throwing in the towel through war exhaustion at some point. Um, so, yeah, the, the comment that Jellicoe was the only person who could lose a war in, the after, in an afternoon was very much true. And the flip side is, obviously, that by um, retaining control of the seas at the end of the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy was able to tighten its blockade because the high seas fleet showed a lot less inclination to come out and resulted in the said aforementioned starvation of Germany, both in terms of resources and food. So... Um, it's definitely worthy of a lot more recognition because one way or the other, Jutland um, really, in to, to a certain degree, decided the way the war was going to go from then on. And finally, before we move on to general questions, Zombie Hero 14 asks, would you consider the Soviets Kirovs as modern iterations of the battlecruiser concept? Why or why not? To be honest, I think the Kirovs are called battlecruisers by some people basically because they're bigger than what counts as a modern day cruiser. Um, they have lots of heavy firepower, but they're not kind of the heavily armoured battle line units that you would expect of a quote-unquote battleship, albeit that they do carry significantly more armour than most modern warships. But I think if you're looking at the actual, in terms of their actual role, no, actually they aren't battle cruisers. Um, because what is the purpose of a battle cruiser? Well, the original battle cruisers, the Invincibles, are designed to sweep the seas of smaller enemy cruisers. Are the Kirovs supposed to go and hunt down enemy cruisers like Ticonderogas? No, they're not. Um, are they designed to act as fleet screen units and scouts uh, for the main battle fleet, the same way that um, British battle cruisers later became and German battle cruisers to a certain extent were intended from the start? Again, no, they're not. Um, are they perhaps designed to form a supplementary fast wing of the battle fleet in a way that was, to a certain degree, the other half of German battle cruiser design in World War One? Again, no. Um, so, in all the operational concepts of a battle cruiser, back when that, the term actually meant something, the Kirovs don't fall into that role. The Kirovs are designed to bring massive amounts of firepower, albeit mostly by with horrifically large missiles um, to bear in direct combat against enemy carriers who are significantly bigger than they are um, albeit they are obviously not insubstantial ships in and of themselves um, that is their primary role uh, it is to sink ships that are much much larger than them much um, displace a lot more and carry believe it or not even more firepower um, in a lot of ways actually <laughs> believe it or not the Kirovs relative to the size and displacement of American supercarriers, are actually kind of fulfilling the role that um, early torpedo boats played uh, when considered to, for use against pre-dreadnought battleships, um, or perhaps some of the torpedo cru early torpedo cruisers. That's actually the kind of role that they're fulfilling, albeit that both role and equipment has diverged so much from um, the time of guns and torpedoes that the, the role wouldn't if 
wouldn't fit. But um, yeah, a what well, a, a anti carrier missile boat is effectively what they are. Um, so yeah, no, that that I wouldn't call them battle cruisers, except just as a lazy a, a lazy way of saying it. it's it's a ship that's bigger than a cruiser, but not a battleship. Um, by role, they are very different. Now, moving on to the more general questions. Uh, the Rake asks, what are your personal definitions and cutoffs for a Dreadnought category? He talks about things like um, barrel length, uh, caliber, etc, etc. So, I think my sort of red lines, as it were, for determining what isn't isn't a Dreadnought design would be um, speed of at least 18 knots, uh, ideally more. Armour obviously must be Krupp Steel um, and must be in line with existing uh, existing battleships' armour values or better. Um, in t once you get to the guns, so the guns for the main battery all have to be the same, and that means same calibre and same barrel length. So um, sort of the, the immediate pre-dreadnoughts where they were sort of pushing 9.2 inch and 10 inch secondary batteries that don't count because their main battery was at 12 inch um and things like the brandenburg class don't count because even though they had more than four uh, 11 inch guns uh, two of them were significantly shorter than the other four so yeah uniform uh, uniform gun barrel caliber uniform gun barrel length uh, those are going to be the main ones. Uh, in terms of firepower, I'd say probably the 11-inch guns used by the German Navy are going to be my lowest threshold in terms of firepower, purely because um, you have things like the British 9.2-inch and the American 10-inch guns that are being used on armoured cruisers. So um, outside of the this sort of armor scheme and such like you some of the even the earlier german pre-dreadnoughts with their 9.4 inch guns you have a difficulty actually really classifying them fully as battleships and less as very heavily armed cruisers in some respects but never mind um since we're looking at dreadnoughts um so yeah 11 inch minimum uh size on those guns and i would say also you need an eight gun broadside um you need four guns as your minimum for decent salvo firing but two extra gun advantage that doesn't really put you that much better off uh versus a uh a well captained pre-dreadnought whereas eight gun broadside that's double the number of guns that puts you a comfortable advantage which justifies you ditching your secondary battery completely um obviously that may mean you need more than eight guns on the ship itself depending on how you lay the turrets out um but yes, and the other thing about having an eight gun uh, broadside is it means you can fire half salvos. So you can fire four guns, get an accurate uh, reading of range, and fire another four guns, get a second accurate reading of range, which means you can time it. Um, let's say if you're firing one shot every 30 seconds or so, which is about average for um, battleship guns in the Dreadnought Age, you can then actually be firing a half salvo every 15 seconds, which means you can then uh, sort of zoom lock in the range to the enemy twice as fast as an enemy with fewer guns which multiplies your firepower even more considerably um the only other caveat i put on there is you mentioned triple turrets and such is i wouldn't worry too much about the type of turret i mean if you're using three triples to give you a nine gun broadside or two quads for an eight gun or four twins or whatever um it's more about i think the number of guns albeit I'd be very interested if someone would try and make a quadruple turret work right at the beginning of the Dreadnought era for main battery guns. That would be uh, quite the impressive thing, considering it took them a while just to get the triple turret working. Um, so yeah, those would be my basic red lines um, for a Dreadnought. Lukeman Hakim asks, What would have happened if the Japanese had focused on building more aircraft carriers in the late 20s and early 30s? Well, it certainly would have made them a lot tougher to to um, defeat in World War Two. Obviously, with the with the Essex 3D print production line going, the uh, U.S. Navy is not really at risk of ever running out of ships. But it could extend the war by quite a considerable period, uh, for two reasons. One, obviously, the Japanese would have more carrier hulls available earlier in the war, which would mean that um, at battles 
where well I mean, a it could mean Pearl Harbor's strike could be a lot worse because they they show up with a lot more aircraft um but then once you get into battles like Coral Sea and Midway um the fact that the Japanese can then show up with a lot more carriers means again a lot more aircraft present a lot more chances to spot the American fleet and a lot more um strike power available to do damage to that fleet so they could have uh, turned sort of half half strategic that strategic defeat tactical victories into full victories quite how they do that i mean obviously this would involve a certain degree of um disobedience to the treaties and well the japanese aren't exactly not known for doing that but still it assumes it assumes a certain degree of people in various na nations overlooking a lot of japanese behavior um but Assuming for a minute they were able to do that, I would say possibly the best way that they could do it would actually be to convert the Congos. Um, converting battleships, as the, they showed with the cargo, has a fair number of issues. And given, although they did get some decent use out of the Congos, um, I would say that they probably get have got even better use out of the Congos um, if when they took them in for refits and stuck all the extra boilers in them that made them go really fast, if instead of rebuilding them as sort of light, fast battleships, they'd actually gone and just stripped them all down and turned them into sort of HMS Furious, HMS Courageous, or Glorious style carrier conversions. Um, that would have given them a uniform class of carrier, which was something else that they lacked in any significant quantity um, up to the, the start of the Second World War. And the other major effect and the reason it would have made the Japanese a lot harder to crack is because if they'd had another four fleet carriers, um, as I said, being the Congos, that would have forced their training regimen and uh, and um, fl uh, aircraft production to be a significantly larger to support the larger number of pilots needed to maintain the entire air fleet, which in turn means that obviously more aircraft means that uh, that with more more of a numerical advantage, it's less likely to suffer massive casualties anyway. Um, but when they do start taking casualties, there's a much larger pool of uh, newly trained and reservist and um, up and coming pilots ready to take over, which means that you wouldn't end up with a situation like you end up at Leyte Gulf, where the Japanese carriers are effectively almost bare and the pilots that are left really mostly are not worth putting up in an aircraft um so yeah that that would have made the japanese a lot more formidable um during the first and middle parts of the second world war and finally before we move on to discord questions christopher schroeder asks in 1908 the u.s almost put its specific fleet base in the philippines either at cebu or manila but because the services could not agree on which one they ended up going with pearl harbor much later um how would the lead up to world war ii have changed if the u.s's fleet base was in the philippines and not hawaii well there's two ways this could go really um but a, the more likely route is probably not a good one um the slightly less likely but possibly more positive route would be that because they're so much closer to Japanese operations in China and uh, such like in the run-up to December the 7th the US fleet is on a lot better alert and as a result um, is a bit better prepared for the Pearl Harbor well the not Pearl Harbor strike um, However, the flip side to that is that the Philippines are a heck of a lot closer to Japan than Hawaii is, which means that instead of it operating at the absolute limit of their range, the Japanese are comfortably within their range and could potentially bring a lot more strike power to bear, potentially including even land-based aircraft. Um, plus, they can bring in their full battle fleet for a follow-up coastal or shore bombardment. Um, so you're talking about more planes... Uh, more intense attacks, possible full-on um, submarine and uh, battleship uh, assault, both obviously with torpedoes and with um, uh, big guns, so could potentially have a lot more devastating effect, um, knock out a significant portion of the US's, uh, US fleet's um, infrastructure as well. Plus, of course, there's a very high chance that they would follow that attack up with troop landings, um, at which point you're not going to get any of the wrecks back 
and with the harbours generally also a little bit deeper than the unusually shallow parts of Pearl Harbour, the chances are those wrecks probably aren't salvageable anyway. Um, so overall, if the US Pacific Fleet was based in the Philippines in 1941, the whatever we would end up calling them, but equivalent of the Pearl Harbor attacks, would have been a lot, a lot worse um, for the US Navy, I think, in all balance of probability. Um, so yeah, um, probably just as well they weren't. And so we're now on to the Discord questions. Le Tank Duckmander asks, what is the best main battery gun for each type of ship in World War II, in your opinion, for destroyers, light and heavy cruisers, and battleships, for the Allied side, and for the Axis side? Well, if we're going strictly by the guns, and ignoring any other issues with things like turret mountings, uh, shell quality, etc., and purely by the gun's ballistic performance, assuming a decent shell... Um, the best main battery gun on the Axis side would probably be the Italian 15-inch gun as seen in the Littorio class. Um, it's got strong competition with the Bismarck's 15-inch, but um, I think the, uh, the Italian gun in and of itself as a gun has slightly fewer issues than the, than the uh, German one. Albeit that it is quite a close call. Um, for Axis heavy and light cruiser guns, well, there isn't really that much choice. I think I'd actually probably take the Otago's 8-inch guns from the Japanese um, and for the heavy cruisers. And for the light cruisers, again, I'm probably going to go with the 6-inch uh, the guns the Japanese used on things like the Megamis. Um, the... The, the the German hippo well the the guns on the Königsbergs and the hippers um, are all right but they suffer from their shells not doing a tremendous amount of damage even when they work as compared to the Japanese guns and there's not really that much wrong with the Japanese guns themselves um, and they hit harder when their shells actually explode for destroyer weapons I'd probably have to go with uh, well if we're not including uh, stuff that wasn't actually put into service, I'm going to go with the 127mm 45 caliber weapon that German destroyers used. Fairly good rate of fire, fairly decent caliber, um, nothing wrong with gun at all, um, and yeah, all in all, a very nice, very nice weapon. Um, most other destroyer weapons uh, on the Axis side I was classify as either too large or too small. The, the German 127 is actually quite a nice little uh, little bracket there. Now, on the Allied side, um, well, you can't really argue battleship main gun. I, the best ba battleship main gun for the Allies um, in World War II has to go to the 16-inch 50 caliber. It is just a monstrous, monstrous weapon. Um, the only way you're going to displace that is if you caveated it to, say, guns that were in service at the beginning of World War II, but you didn't, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, Light and heavy cruiser guns, I think the 8-inch guns you see on the Baltimore class, and probably, a, I would say, maybe the 6-inch guns that you get on the Towns um, probably would be my picks, um, ra rather than anything else. For destroyers, it is a bit of a toss-up, because um, if you want destroyers that are very good at anti-surface actions I'd go with the 4.7 inch guns found on the tribals but if you want a more general purpose destroyer I'd go with the rather obvious choice of the 5 inch 38 caliber gun found on US destroyers. Snoo Snoo asks what is the largest practical gun one could mount on a battleship assuming constant escalation of size? I think I may have said this before but I think uh, practically speaking you're probably capping out at 18 inches if you're going to go with well guns the way you have more than one of them. Uh, partly that's just for sheer size reasons, partly that's also for reasons of ammunition handling. The Obviously you have the square cube law, 20 inch shells that start weighing, well, 18 inch shells weigh stupidly large amounts, 20 inch shells weigh truly ridiculous amounts and would start to strain machinery uh, and leave you with very limited ammo and very uh, slow reload, so it's not really practical I think personally to go much beyond an 18 inch weapon um maybe on some truly colossal ships you could get away with a 20 inch but 
it will be very very difficult to do so um the other thing is obviously as i say when, when you're looking at practical as in would be useful in a fight or practical as in it could physically be mounted in a ship and used in which case well in the latter case i guess you could just take a battleship and turn it into a gigantic fixed position monitor and mount the uh, dora gun from uh, the siege of sevastopol on it wouldn't be much use but you could do it rolf son of rolf asks what is a landing gun a landing gun is well as it sounds um it's a rather lovely colonial invention basically in the early days well in the age of sail it was common to land some of the ship's armament um, for use in sieges and such but later on as uh, the colonial period developed in the 19th century it did become more and more common for ships to end up having to land part of their armament uh, particularly in the boer wars a number of british cruisers landed uh, quite a few of their uh, main and secondary batteries in order to assist with land campaigns and so the landing gun was an attempt to not strip a ship of its actual firepower by supplying uh, naval ships with a certain number of light to medium field artillery pieces built along naval lines which could then be taken off of a ship and used in colonial expeditions and such to support any infantry or marines that might be landed um, and obviously they would quite often be crewed by members of the ship's crew. Serafina asks, what was the point of the French submarine Surcouf? Well, it had a twofold purpose, one of which was the fact that World War I had shown that submarines generally couldn't carry that many torpedoes, and also torpedoes were somewhat unreliable um, in expensive weapons. So of uh, quite a few um, submarine kills on both sides, uh, well, kills by submarines, I should say, on both sides were accomplished using uh, deck guns. So part of the motivation was, well, uh, bigger and more deck guns equals better raiding capability. But also, as with so many things in the interwar period, it was also an attempt to do an end run around the naval treaties. Because the naval treaties, if you remember, had limited the displacement and gun calibre present on battleships, cruisers, and eventually splitting those into light and heavy cruisers, etc, um, etc. Et what they hadn't done is sent any limits on submarines. So with France having a overseas, fairly large overseas empire, but a relatively low cap on the number of ships it was allowed to build in terms of cruisers and battleships, it was a French attempt to get around that by going, well, if we build an underwater cruiser, it will be a submarine, and there are no limits to submarines, so we can build as many as we want. So yes, it was, it was also legitimately designed to engage in surface gun combat uh, with its twin 8-inch guns. Siphon Signal asks, in the book War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, there is the ironclad Thunderchild. Was that a real ship? So, no, Thunderchild was made up entirely for War of the Worlds, unfortunately. Um, as for what it was, it's a little bit more difficult than you might imagine to specify, because Thunderchild is described in the books actually as an ironclad ram, um, which... If you look at the time the book was written in, it implies a sort of one of the torpedo rams, a bit like HMS Polyphemus. However, at the same time, because of the Battle of Lyssa and the advent of torpedo rams and the general craze everyone had for ramming things, um, an awful lot of different ships were described as rams. Basically, any ship with a ram bow in popular media at the time was called a ram up to and including battleships at points. So Thunderchild could have been conceptualised as a torpedo ram or an actual um, pre-Dreadnought-style battleship. The fact that it doesn't fire any torpedoes at the Martian walkers, albeit it might have a bit of a problem with that considering they're on stilty legs, um, but the fact that it seems to engage mostly in ramming and gunfire would indicate to me that it's possibly more towards the gunship or battleship side of things than a necessarily a torpedo ram. But then again, there were torpedo rams that did have fairly heavy main battery guns as well. So, yeah, not a real ship, and it's never 100% clear exactly what kind of ship it would have been. Scolding Coda asks, do you know anything about the warships and submarines that Pepsi got from Russia? So a lot of you have probably heard the story, which is completely true, um, that at one point the Pepsi company owned 17 submarines, a cruiser, a destroyer, and a frigate, 
And no, they weren't planning to go and invade Georgia to finish off Coca-Cola once and for all. Although, in retrospect, that may not have been such a bad idea. Um, anyway, no, what, what had happened was that the Russians really liked Pepsi, and they had done for several decades. Um, previously, the trade had been, you give us Pepsi, we'll give you Stolichnaya Vodka. Um, unfortunately, when the deal came for renegotiation uh, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, Due to Russian actions in Afghanistan, Stolichnaya was not selling quite as well as it had in the past, so there was a little bit of a gap in the bartering position. So the Russians agreed, in part, to for sell the aforementioned 20 total naval ships to the Pepsi Corporation uh, for about $150,000 apiece as part of a £3 billion deal. What's quite often not reported in all the memes is that this was part of a package deal. So yes, Pepsi did get the um, old obsolete submarines uh, and the three warships, but they also got the continued rights to sell Stolich Naya Vodka, and on top of that, possibly the more lucrative part of it was they also got rights to 10 fairly large Soviet tankers and merchant ships, which they could then lease out to other companies um, for trade purposes, which is obviously a bit of an ongoing revenue earner there. So that was the sum total deal. Um, but yes, they unfortunately, memes aside, they did not become the sixth most powerful military in the world at the time, largely on the grounds that, well, all the ships that were being sold were being sold for scrap value. Um, so, yeah, they they were basically just about intact enough to tow to Sweden, where they were then probably broken up. Michael McLeod says, If both Lusitania and Mauritania in World War I were outfitted as armed merchant cruisers, and they ran into the four Kaiser-class liners fitted out as auxiliary cruisers, which group do you think would be the last one standing? Well, shades of uh, Carmania versus Cap Trafalgar there, I think. It is also, believe it or not, and I can't believe I'm actually saying this, is an interesting lineup. So let's look at their statistics. So the Kaiser class, uh, well, there's four of them, so four versus two. So there's an immediate advantage to the Germans there. However, uh, the Kaiser class liners uh, displace around about 25,000 tons and are capable of just over 22 knots. Whereas uh, Lusitania and Mauritania are significantly larger, uh, displacing about 44,000 tons and capable of a slightly faster 25 knots. So, yeah, two bigger, faster ships versus four slightly slower, slower and significantly smaller ships. Now, obviously, neither side has any armour, but the armament is interesting. So the Kaiser class... We do know that in World War One, at least one of them was armed as an auxiliary cruiser with 605mm guns and a couple of 37mm guns. That's uh, 4.1 inch guns as the main battery. No ship of Lusitania's size was ever armed by the Admiralty as far as I can tell, but looking at some of the smaller ships, um, significantly smaller actually, that were armed, set up as armed merchant cruisers, um, some of them carried up to 12 guns and the Admiralty tended to favour using 6-inch weapons as opposed to the lighter German 105 or 4.1-inch weapons. So this obviously is a little bit of a guesswork, but extrapolating up based on size and displacement, I would estimate Lusitania and Mauritania would probably be carrying somewhere between... 16 to 26 inch guns probably the towards the lower end of that to be honest but i mean they are massive ships um so even and even if we to be honest even if we take the 12 that was the uh, historical maximum on smaller ships that still means that ironically we have an almost perfect match in gun numbers because lusitania and mauritania both outgun uh the kaisers two to one or possibly more and of course, because you've got all the superstructure and everything in the way, very few of these guns are ever centerline mounted. So you're literally going to have an old school broadside engagement um, with massive cruise liners. I mean, it's, it's utterly ridiculous. It'd be absolutely hilarious to watch. Um, so yeah, it, in theory, the individual British liners would have a firepower advantage, 
but obviously they could be double teamed by the Kaiser class. The fact that neither side actually has any district centralized fire control actually works in the in the Lusitania Mauritania's favour because um, there is no real significant disruption to splitting your fire on either side because it's not affecting the other side in the slightest. Um, other than obviously potentially getting hit by a lot more guns than you're individually hitting each enemy ship with. So I honestly couldn't call it. I mean, all the Germans could set up, up a little four ship line of line of stern uh, line of battle and engage in a single um, furious cannonade with uh, the British ships, in which case they would probably win. Alternatively, British ships could use their size and speed to try and cut the line Nelson style and then end up in a furious both sides broadside engagement um, in which case their heavier guns and likely more of them might give them the advantage but uh, to be honest with on the ships of this size it's a case of fling as much high explosive at it and hope that something vital breaks so yeah I have no idea um, but I'd pay good money to watch Turret Welder asks, how effective would the Japanese man torpedoes be if used in mass assaults? To be honest, not particularly. The Japanese did try, and they didn't have a lot of success. So there's two main reasons. One is that, um, although based on the Type 93 torpedo, the Kai 10s were a lot slower, uh, which meant that relative intercept was much more difficult. I mean, um, to be honest, the vast majority of Kai 10s used their maximum speed was 30 knots, um, which means that actually some US battleships, almost all US cruisers and practically any destroyer or carrier could actually just flat out outrun them and there's nothing they could do about it. But also, um, that's, as I say, that's their maximum speed. And to, even though they are modified torpedoes to a certain degree with all the extra bits and pieces that were added to them, they were effectively small suicide midget submarines, and so a fair number of them were destroyed by anti-submarine efforts. The additional problem being, obviously, that uh, one of the one of the wet reasons the torpedo is so deadly, is, especially in that time, is that because it runs just deep enough that a ship's primary armament is not really that effective against them whereas a Kai-10 needs to be close enough to the surface for the pilot to either see or use his little periscope to see, which meant renders them more vulnerable to air and surface attack. So yeah, between their low speed, relatively low speed and uh, vulnerability to counterattack, massed assaults by them are just really a waste of waste of lives um doesn't really get you anywhere the the sort of the success rate of kai 10s versus the original type 93 they were based on is actually in favor of the unguided type 93 believe it or not and finally Cragger asks why do you think the pre-dreadnought era is so often overlooked it's practically half the age of naval combat of steam and steel and just dismissed once dreadnought comes around i think partially it's time the sort of the battles of World War Two still have veterans who are with us, and up until relatively recently, certainly within my lifetime, there were a number of veterans of World War One who were still going strong. Um, so th there is that certain degree of relatability, but also the fact is there just weren't that many major wars that pre-dreadnoughts were involved in. The only real big pre-dreadnought conflict was the Russo-Japanese War, which obviously does get studied quite a lot with Tsushima and all that. But I think if you if you asked this question in Japan, because of the Russo-Japanese War, it probably would not be ignored quite as much or overlooked. Um, whereas in the Western media, Britain and America, as I say, well, Britain was just sitting there with fleets and fleets and fleets of pre-dreadnoughts. No one really wanted to mess with it. Um, and the rest of the European countries kind of just left well enough alone. And then you compare and contrast that to the naval escapades of World War One and World War Two, and it's just, it, it looks more spectacular um, and easier for people to understand. Um, so I think that's that's why it ends up getting overlooked an awful lot, I think, which is, which is a bit unfortunate because there's a lot more variety and uh, technological development in the pre-Dreadnought era as composed to the Dreadnought era.
And so with that, that brings this episode of The Dry Dock to a close. Just one final note, since we're not quite, but just about a month away from Tankfest. If any of you are coming down to Tankfest, um, I will be there Friday and Saturday. That's Tankfest in Bovington in Dorset in the UK. Um, Assuming the weather is somewhat acceptable, I have a nice t-shirt that's being printed up with the channel logo uh, slapped on it front and back, so I should be fairly identifiable. Feel free to come up and say hi, whatever, if one or two of you are there. It will be a little bit weird, I guess, but hey, that's uh, risks of the job anyway. Um, I will be meeting a few other YouTubers there as well, so if you see me in the middle of filming that or something, that will be why. And uh, once again, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope to see you again in the next video and please, please, please do give me some feedback below as to what I said in the channel admin portion at the beginning um, about how you want me to treat YouTube's rather unexpected enforced monetization policy. I told you this would all end in tears.